can. So, uh, Nate, if you could put up there Psalm 46. God is our refuge and strength, a very present help in trouble. There's one word that I want to show you guys that I thought was really neat. God is our refuge. You think of the word refuge, you know, it's like a covering. It's a place to hide. So he is our covering. He is a place where we can hide. He is our strength. So whenever you're feeling weak, whenever you're not strong, you can lean into God and receive that strength. He is our refuge, our covering, our protection, as well as our strength to be able to uh, confront any kind of uh, battles or issues that we may be facing. Um, A very present help in trouble. So that word present, very present help in trouble, is the word matzah. Anybody know what matzah is? Yeah, yeah, bread. I don't know if they named it after that, but I still think it's really cool. Matzah. And so I won't spell it in the Hebrew, but just to point your attention to, and it, um, it means to find, to come upon, to be found in, and to come forth. God is our refuge. It's a shelter. Um, the covering. Uh, he's our ever-present help, the matzah, to find, to come upon, to be found in, come forth. Let's go down to verse 10. Be still and know that I am God. I will be exalted among the nations. I will be exalted in the earth. So be still is... We talked about this before. It's having like being quiet on the inside. You're not having any fears, not having any worries or concerns. Just be calm, be still, know that I am God. And uh, the know, you see where it says be still and know. That word know is the word, the Hebrew word yada, yada. What does it mean to know something or to know someone? So yada just means to no, like you experientially know. This word yada, I'm just, I'm just going to write it in English, is reveal oneself. So know that I am God. Know that I am God. So let him be revealed to you. The way that he is revealed, how is God revealed to us? You know, there was a time where people would call unto God as by, by a name, by a certain name. They would call him Jehovah. They'd call him Jehovah Rapha, Jehovah Nisi. They would call him um, El Elyon. There was a bunch of different names that people would refer to uh, God as. And th- these are all different names that he has all throughout the Bible. And under the Old Testament, they would refer to him by these particular names. But... Um, that's because he was. That's how he revealed himself. He revealed himself as doing something, as performing something, um, or an ability that he had. The Jews never referred to him as Father. They never referred to God as Father. That almost be a disres- disrespectful thing, because if you think about it, or it's like to them it would be blasphemy, because. If you're saying, if you're calling God Father, what does that make you? Son, a child. So you'd be a descendant. That means that you'd be God, right? You'd have God in your blood. So then that, to them, they would consider that blasphemy. But it was Jesus who actually came to reveal God in a different light. It was Jesus who came to reveal Jehovah in a different relationship so that we can have this different relationship with him, not just as Jehovah, not just as God, not just as master, but as father. So we can actually call him father. So we can receive from him. We can have a relationship with him because as a master, the relationship can only go so far. But as a father, the relationship is totally open and it's for you to enjoy. It's a personal, it becomes a personal relationship. That title father is a personal thing between you and him. 
As God, it's a structured relationship where you have to be a certain way with God. You have to act this way. You have to talk this way in order to be in God's presence. But now as father, you can come to him as that, as that personal relationship of father. There is no certain way to come to him. It's just, you just go to the father as you are. You just come to him seeking him, seeking help or whatever, or you want to praise him or worship him or whatever. You can go freely to God because Jesus came to reveal this God as father. So this matzah, I thought this was really interesting because the matzah bread, has everybody heard, has everybody heard of matzah bread? It's used, it's that flat bread and it's, it's used for communion. Does everybody know what communion is? The bread and the wine. The bread represents the body of Jesus. The the wine represents the the blood of Jesus. So it's pretty interesting that this word, very present help, is the word matzah, which is what we use for bread, and it represents the body of Jesus. And yada, know that I am God, is the revelation, the revelation of who God is. So the only way that you can have God revealed to you as father is by that blood it's, or by that body, that matzah. It's through Jesus that you can actually have this revelation of who God is to you. So with that being said, I want to go over to and show you just a couple other things. Isaiah 46 and verse 10. We're going to declare some things into our next year. But I want to show you some scriptures as to why we do it. How does faith come? By hearing. And hearing what? The word of God. Faith comes by hearing and hearing the word of God. So whenever we endeavor to do these things, we want to build our faith on it. So I want to give you some word to attach our faith to so when we speak into our next year, we can expect that these things will come to pass and that we can see it happen in our lives. So Isaiah 46, verse 10 Declaring the end from the beginning and from the ancient times, things that are not yet done, saying, my counsel shall stand and I will do all my pleasure. So this is the word of the Lord. This is God speaking, saying that he's declaring the end from the beginning. This is what the Lord does. He declares the end from the beginning, and this is what he has done. So I want you to look at that word declaring. What does declaring mean? You hear declare, and what do you think? In the Hebrew, it means make known, and it means to publish, and it means to profess, to tell, so to speak. It also means to show yourself in front of another. So it's the word nagad. So we're going to tie all these things together at its right time. So Nagad is to profess, to be reported, to make known, to show yourself in front of another. Now, the root of this, the very root of this, it's a two-letter, two-letter word. It's a nun and a gimel. So you can say an N and a G. So this in Hebrew looks like this. So these are Hebrew letters, a nun, a gimel, and a dalad. That makes up nagad. So the the child root, the ancient Hebrew root, how this word comes to be is by just two letters. And this is how all the words get formed. It's just by these two letters, the nun and the gimel. So out of that, that's how they, they... build these these words. Now, and each of these letters, actually one letter has its own definition. It has its own number. It has its own purpose. So we could actually go into this nun and talk about what does nun mean and what does what does nun look like. It's really it's really phenomenal how deep this stuff actually goes. But these two together means to shine. And it means morning not crying morning, but morning like the early morning, a.m., when the sun comes up and shines. 
It's a revealing oneself. It's a revealing oneself. If we can go to 1 Peter chapter 1, but with the precious blood of Christ as of a lamb, without blemish and without spot, he indeed was foreordained before the foundation of the world, but was manifest in these last times for you. So who was foreordained before the foundation of the world? The lamb who was slain without spot and without blemish. Who is that? It was Jesus. Jesus is the lamb slain without spot and without blemish. It was preordained before the foundation of the world. And we read over there in Isaiah declaring the what? The end from the beginning. You following? The Lord declares the end from the beginning. And here we see in 1 Peter, Jesus was foreordained before when? The foundation of the world. Before the earth was ever formed, he's saying that the lamb was ordained, already made up to be slain. Go to Revelation. If you can pull up Revelation verse 13 or chapter 13 and verse 8. All who dwell on the earth will worship him, Jesus, whose names have not been written in the book of life of the lamb slain from when? From the foundation of the world. Why was the lamb slain? Can anybody tell me why the lamb was slain? The lamb was slain for our sins. But what sins? For what sins? What is a sin? What is sin? What does sin mean? Sin means to miss the mark. The ultimate mark that he wanted us to hit was a relationship with him. Our whole purpose, the whole reason why we were created was to have a relationship with God. That's why he created us. He created us for his enjoyment. He created us for him and for us to enjoy him as well. So the sin is not having that relationship with him. The Bible talks about in Amos, I believe it's 3.3, can two walk together except they be agreed? Can two walk together except they be agreed? It's not for long, because eventually it starts to go like this. They just grow apart. Can't walk together for, for too long. When there's two different ideals, God who is holy, God who is perfect, God who is full of love and compassion and mercy, he pours out his compassion and his mercy, but then the person who doesn't receive it, the person who doesn't want to hear it, the person who doesn't want that kind of relationship, they're not walking together anymore. It's pulling them away from love, pulling them away from mercy, pulling them away from compassion. So eventually that relationship is strained, and it's sin that causes the split. It's the missing the mark that's causing the split. Are you following what I'm saying? not desiring this relationship with God. So sin entered in over in the garden, right? The Garden of Eden where Lucifer went into a snake. The snake beguiled the man and the woman. Well, the woman first and then, then it went down to the man. And that's when sin entered. The relationship between God and man was then broken because they decided to build a relationship with another voice with another being over God. So now sin came in. And this is why the lust of the flesh, the, the, self, the selfishness and covetousness, murders and, and strife came in is because it all became self-centered. It all became me, me, me. It all became separate from God because God can't have fellowship. What, what kind of fellowship does light have with darkness? None. They can't dwell together. But the lamb was slain when? Before they even fell. Before sin ever even entered into the world, the lamb was already slain. It was already a done deal. You know every law that's written in the Old Testament? You know that there's a whole bunch of laws that are written in the Old Testament? It's not just the Ten Commandments. There's like 612 of those laws. There's, there's, a, there's a grip of them. 
There's certain laws that priests have to live by. There's laws that the people have to live by. And do you know what all those laws are for? It's to create a relationship to be able to have with God. It's a demonstration that if you want to have a relationship with me, then this is how you need to be. But then they realize, wait a minute, we can't live to this standard. I can't sacrifice a a goat every day, especially like today, right? Like nobody really does. Nobody does that anymore. There's a, there's a little sect of them that do it in Israel. But um, can't live by all these standards. Not perfectly anyway, because we're men. We can't live to that standard. But that was the whole point. The whole point was to show us, to show people, you can't, you can't live a perfect life, not without Jesus. Jesus lived the perfect and sinless life. The Bible says that he who knew no sin became sin. So all the things that separated us from God, he took it upon himself so that we don't have to be separated from God any longer. We can actually have a relationship, not with with God, but with the Father. Yes, he's God, but we can actually come to him and say, Father. In the Hebrew word, the word that Paul would use is the word Abba. And that's the word that Jesus proclaimed on the cross. Abba, Abba. Why have you forsaken me? You know why Jesus said that? Why have you forsaken me? The Bible says at that time, it grew dark. It became night for what? A th- what was it? A three-hour window? I forget what the window was. There was a window of time where it was just black. During that time, God turned his face away from Jesus. He turned away from Jesus. Think of this. Jesus was there. From the beginning, he is the wisdom of God. He is the word of God. The Bible describes it in John chapter one. He is the word of God. He is the wisdom of God. And in Proverbs eight, it talks about, I was there, the wisdom of God, with him before the foundations of the world. Daily his delight. And here he was up on the cross with God no longer looking at him. He had turned his face away. He turned his face away because there was so much sin there. Every sin, every sickness, every illness was all poured out on the flesh of Jesus. The father turned. Not only did he turn because all that was there, but he turned so that he would never turn on you. The Bible says that he'll never leave you nor forsake you, never, because it already happened once. It happened through Jesus. The Bible also says that through one man's sin, through one man's sin, we all fell short. But by one man's life, how much more, how much more by, his, by this one man's act of righteousness, this Jesus, the eternal washing of our sins. If the man's sin through Adam can affect all of us, how much more does this righteousness through Jesus, how much more can it affect our lives? Much more. When it's an act from God and by God through God, because Jesus was man and God. He was both. The Father declared the end from the beginning when he when when he slain the lamb before the foundation of the world. Before man could sin, before man did sin, the lamb was already sacrificed and crucified. Already it was a done deal. That's why it's called the finished work. Because now all this law that's in these pages right here, in uh, right up through here of the Bible, look how much law. I mean, this is like, well, not all of it is the law, but there are the, the books of the law, right? There's a lot of law that exists right here in the Old Testament. Many years are covered right here. All of it's been fulfilled all through Jesus. If you go back through the Old Testament and you look at and you read the word with the lens of it's already done through Jesus, you'll see Jesus in the Old Testament and you'll see how he actually finished the work. Can you put up Ephesians chapter five, Nate, and verse one? Therefore, be imitators of God as dear children. Be imitators of God as dear 
children. So if God declared the end from the beginning by putting everything on Jesus, he did it from the beginning before, everything, before anything happened. He covered everything from the beginning, declaring the end from the beginning. And here we have the scripture saying that we should be imitators of him as dear children. So shouldn't we do the same thing? 